Most people of my generation know that Howard Hughes, the immortal, lived in Las Vegas for four years. We found out things about his time in this city that nobody else has ever discovered. From the 1930s until his death, Howard Hughes was the Bill Gates of his era. An aviator, a talented movie producer, an inventor, a visionary. When he moved to Las Vegas, he bought out the mob and legitimized the gambling industry. I remember I was traveling pretty fast when I came past the Cottontail Ranch, but I, by the time I'd got up here, I, you know, I decided I'd better, you know, pull off somewhere and relieve myself. That's the way he was lying when you. Yep when you saw him just like that. I had to. I mean, it was something I had to do. I had to help him. God, you know, I just help, help somebody and I'm going to prison for it. <laughs> Who's telling the truth? Either they are or the witnesses that I found are. The proverbial light bulb went off in my head, and I read the rest of the story and realized this man's telling the truth. Ain't nobody going to believe that this actually is happening. Uh, you know, how, how do you explain something like that? There is no evidence that Melvin Dumar forged that will. In our investigation of the Howard Hughes story, we met two characters that had never met in person. Melvin Dumar and Robert Diero, and their stories matched up to explain how Hughes would leave the hotel, get in a plane piloted by Darrow, and end up in a brothel in Beatty, Nevada. And that is where Melvin Dumar found Howard down and out in a ditch. Let's face it, what Hughes not only got out of the hotel, he got out of Las Vegas, he got out of the country, and he was gone. That a man as powerful uh, as controlling, as wealthy, and with the appetite for aviation and sex that Mr. Hughes had, would lock himself up in a hotel room for four years. That's what's unbelievable. Hey, tell me about this Bob Guerrero. Is he legit? Very successful businessman in Las Vegas. He even has a street named after him here in town. He's an Italian count. Has some bloodlines is, to Italy. Is he related to the auctioneer guy? He is the auctioneer. He is the, oh, okay. that, that he is sense. the auctioneer. Right. That's one of his many successful oh, businesses. And um, I kept hearing that he'd worked for Hughes Aviation and that he maybe flew Howard Hughes on some of his trips up north. And he filled in some blanks in the Melvin Dumar story that by putting those two different characters together gave total credibility to, the, to Melvin's story. Here's what makes it credible, credible for me, is that the story that Bob Darrow is telling is not very complimentary to him. If anything, it makes him look right. like a, a bad guy because right. he's a pilot who flew up to this whorehouse and got so drunk he couldn't fly home, <laughs> fell asleep, and that's how Hughes got away from him. So that's not a story you want to tell right. uh, to the public, but he told it anyway uh, to help sort of buttress the story told by Melvin Dumar. Basically, Gary Magnuson went into it thinking that Melvin Dumar was full of crap, and he, he didn't believe the story. And then the more he dug and the more witnesses he dug up, the more he believed it. To the, to, in the end, he believes it entirely. Here's a little guy up against a, a machine of Hughes estate lawyers, all of whom have gotten their big chunk and they don't want this little guy who drives a milk truck from Utah to get a single damn dime. I think there's a chance that, that he was 100% truthful in everything he told us. Well, Melvin Dumar was telling the truth. There's no doubt about it. You can't make that story up. Whether or not the Mormon will was legit, that's a whole different question. I don't think Melvin Dumar was lying. I think he was telling the truth. I think he picked up Howard Hughes out there in the desert. You don't have to remember what you said because the truth is always the truth. If you tell a lie, you have to remember that line. Lucky me, can't you see? I'm in love. Here's what makes our stuff so valuable is that Jimmy Shagger only gave one on camera interview and then he died. So That's nobody true. else is getting yeah. an exclusive with him. Yeah. Jimmy Shagger was kind of a Robin Hood type figure. Jimmy Shagra in the 1970s was the biggest drug smuggler in the world. His drug of choice was marijuana. He built an unbelievable empire and with the millions of dollars he made, 
He gambled a lot of it and laundered his money through the casinos. He also had a soft spot in his heart. Everyone pretty much knew that he was a criminal, that he was getting these footlockers full of cash from some kind of criminal enterprise, and they let it go because that was the way the town was in those days. He was incredibly generous. The stories that Jack Sheehan has dug up about Shagger giving away money and cars to cocktail waitresses. He bought her a car, paid off the mortgage in her house. Those are, are legendary here. At the same time, he was a very dark person as well, tough. I mean, there is no question he had a pivotal role in the assassination of a federal judge. He got off for it, doesn't mean he didn't do it. So he was a dual nature guy, and I did get to know him very well. We had him over for Christmas dinner with his wife and my young kids. His wife made balloon hats for my children. You would have thought that Art Linkletter was in our living room when I knew, in fact, that he was a cold-blooded killer and a drug smuggler. But like so many interesting characters in Las Vegas, there was a duality to Jimmy Shagra that made him fascinating. He was brilliant, he was evil, he was all of the above but he also was part of the mosaic of Las Vegas history. I thought that I could buy Judge Wood off and I tr tried through a family member, he wouldn't budge. Uh, my, my biggest regret is that uh, Judge Wood was, was killed. Oscar uh, was not only my lawyer, he was also, he became my friend. I thank God for Oscar every day. Oscar Goodman calls himself the world's happiest mayor. Before that, he was a top drawer criminal defense attorney. He calls his acquittal of Jimmy Shagra on murder charges the high point of his legal career. The judge left his apartment, walked to his car, saw that his attires were flattened, turned around to go back and call somebody, and a bullet hit him in the back of the spine, and the jury came back not guilty. And that was one of your big wins. That was a, it was a big win. The convicted hitman was Charles Harrelson, father of actor Woody Harrelson. That murder marked the fall of the empire of the Vegas Kingpin and his crew. It was Scarface meets Casino meets Blow. Jimmy Shagra first came to Las Vegas when he was only 17 years old. He bought a new suit, he rented a hooker, and he declared Vegas the greatest city on earth. Jimmy made his bodyguards and pilots millionaires, and they blew a big part of it on drugs, gambling, and women. He would bring in bags full of cash, set them on the cashier's counter at Caesars, and say, count the money, I'm going to gamble. True or not true? It's true, but not bags, I just, uh, the footlockers. This was the place, Caesars Palace, where Jimmy Shagra once made the hotel sign a $10 million marker to him so they could pay off their gambling debts. In terms of smugglers around the world, were you as big as anybody at your oh, peak? I think I was the biggest ever then. Biggest ever? Ever, yeah. The end of the road for Jimmy Shagra occurred in 1979 in Las Vegas. He saw the end was near. And, you know, it's all, it was a made-for-movie way that this guy ended up giving himself up. I mean, I it was like Butch and Sundance. He had a bunch he of money at, in a diaper bag. He had $180,000 in a diaper bag, but he, he was with his wife and two little kids, like one and three years old, hiding out in a motel, waiting to get a face lift to change his look. And he saw all these cars surrounding him, and he told his wife, I'm going to give myself up. And he jumped in his car, drove down the strip, and he cut in front of a black and white Metro cop named Dave Hansen. He jumped out in front of the cop car, raised his hands in the air, and said, I'm Jimmy Shagra, and I want you to arrest me. Most accounts that you read in these old stories say that there's absolutely no question that you ordered the hit of Maximum John Wood. What do you say to that? 